Okay. So the metalloids are the elements on the periodic table that have properties of both metals and nonmetals, and they tend to be decent conductors of heat and electricity. So to review the group or the or the groups on the periodic table are things that go up and down. The periods on the periodic table are things that go right and left. And then the metals are elements that tend to be malleable. That is, they can be made into thin sheets. They are shiny. They have some luster and they're good conductors of heat and electricity. Um, Nonmetals are dull. They don't have a lot of shininess, um, but they're poor conductors of heat and electricity. And then metalloids, like I said, have properties of both. So any questions about the key vocabulary for this part of the unit? If you have questions, you can throw them in the chat. Otherwise, we are going to continue going forward. Okay. So um, there are three main sections of the periodic table, and I'm going to pop back over here um, to this particular slide, and we'll talk about that in a second. So the three main sections of the periodic table, oops, wrong one. This is the one I want. Got a lot of things going on here. I'm going to get to here, go into present mode. Now, on your periodic table, what I would do if I were you is I would like get to the point where you might be able to shade some things in or color some things um, because that might be helpful. Because the three main sections of the periodic table, we've got our metals, we've got our nonmetals, and our metalloids. So all the metals tend to be in the left side of the periodic table. So everything that's shaded in here is considered a metal. And if you're a person who's like, ah, oh, I don't know how to do that, what you could do on your notes is you could simply go ahead and you could um, write metals on the left side of your periodic table. Or you could just take the highlighting tool and just highlight them and say, hey, all of these things are metals. Um, some people are doing that. Um, uh, others are just maybe taking it in. It's totally fine. Um, note that aluminum is included in the metals, but germanium element 32 and antimony element number 51 are not included in the metals. So everything that's on the left-hand side are metals with the exception of germanium, antimony, oh, and hydrogen. Hydrogen kind of does what it wants. Your nonmetals then are the elements on the right-hand side of the periodic table, or as you may want to put it, they are the elements that um, are on the right-hand side of the periodic table. They're mostly gases. Some of them are solids. There's one liquid, which happens to be bromine. And then the weird exception, which would be uh, hydrogen, is a nonmetal as well. And then lastly, the elements on the periodic table that are known as metalloids are the six elements that appear to follow the stair-step line. It's boron, silicon, germanium, arsenic, antimony, and tellurium. These are your metalloids. So um, I can see that a lot of you are, or some of you are in the process of attempting to copy um, and make this uh, and make this work out for you. So I'm going to kind of give you a second to uh, fill things in or shade things or circle things as you see fit. Um, so I'm just going to kind of pause here, talk to myself, talking to myself. All right. Okay. A lot of you look like you've got it somewhat handled, so we're going to kind of move forward. Now, some columns on the periodic table have very special names. And they have special names because the elements that are in those columns, are they have similar properties. So the elements in the first column are known as the alkali metals. So on your periodic table, what I would probably do is I would, I, I would like draw a line or an arrow or something, and I would write alkali metals near the first column. So the alkali metals are the elements in the periodic table that all have similar chemical properties. They are very reactive. What I mean by that is, is we, they are never found in nature as just like pure lithium or pure sodium or pure potassium. The way they are found in nature is they're bonded to something else. They can't, they are so unstable, they can't be by themselves. So we call those the alkali metals. Those are your lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, and francium. Um, and the column directly to the right of that, column number two, group number two, are known as the alkaline earth metals. And you might want to go ahead and label that. 
is an alkaline earth metal. These elements are also relatively unstable. Um, they're not found in nature as free elements, and they um, and they're all in the same column. So meaning they have similar properties. So it's beryllium, magnesium, calcium, strontium, barium, and radium. And then the next group is actually a group of columns. It's, it's, it's columns 3 to 12, and we refer to those elements as the transition metals. They're transition metals because they don't always follow all of the rules or all of the properties of each other, but they all are good conductors of heat and electricity. And then the last type of element, or not the last type, we're going to skip columns 13, 14, 15, and 16, and we're going to go to column 17, and in column 17, that is your halogens. So these fluorines, chlorines, bromines, iodines, and astatines, these are known as your halogens. And then the last column on the periodic table is column 18, and column 18 has a special name that we refer to as the noble gases. The noble gases are very, very, very stable, which means they don't react, tend to react with anything. Sorry, we can force some of them to react, but most of them will not react on their own. So that's one of the ways that we kind of look at it. Now, so we've got your halogen, so we've got your alkali metals, your alkaline earth metals, your transition metals, your halogens, and your noble gases. Now, the way that we might use these or be assessed on these is I might say, hey, um, element, I don't know, uh, chlorine is an example of, and you'd have to tell me it's a halogen. Or you might say, I might say like, hey, name a uh, noble gas. And you would like probably pick your favorite noble gas, which is xenon, like me. And then you might say, I might say like um, iron and molybdenum and osmium are examples of and you would say transition metals and then everybody would be like yeah you're probably screaming this at your table at your at, at at your um at your house right now you're kind of playing along and screaming this so that's probably what i'm imagining is happening so these are the different columns that you're going to have to be responsible for being able to identify stuff in any questions here okay now Remember, valence electrons are found in the furthest out energy level. And I want to take a second to kind of go back to uh, talk about that um, because here we go. All right. So valence electrons, right? So if I'm talking about something like sodium, for example, sodium has an electron configuration of 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1. So its valence energy level is the third energy level, it's the biggest energy level, and it only has one electron in it. So the elements of the periodic table that all have one valence electron all happen to be located in the same column. And as a result of that, they're all the elements in period one, or in group one. So what I'm getting at here is that is that all of the elements in column one have one valence electron. And all of the elements in, in, in um, column two have two valence electrons. So for example, magnesium would be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, making it have two valence electrons. And then we're going to skip completely over uh, columns 3 through 12, the transition metals, because they kind of do their own thing, which we'll spend time, I think, Thursday talking about, and go to column 13, which is going to have three valence electrons. Column 14 is, would have four valence electrons. And you might notice that there's a pattern forming here. So column 15 would have five valence electrons. Column 16 would have six valence electrons. Column 17 would have seven valence electrons. And column 18 would have eight valence electrons, except for helium, which has two. Um, so the issue is, is that you should be able to look at the periodic table and be like, oh, I know how many valence electrons an element has based on where it is in the periodic table. And so we do that by 
looking at these particular columns and say, all right, an element with one valence electron would be like lithium, sodium, uh, potassium, rubidium, cesium, or francium. An element with seven valence electrons could be something like fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, astatine. So those are, those are ways that we can use that. All right, now, um, the next thing I want to talk about is how metals tend to lose electrons in, an, in order to obtain a full octet. So if we remember, I'm going to talk about sodium again. So if I have sodium's electron configuration, which is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1, right? So if it has 3s1 and it loses this electron, it then has electron, a remaining electron configuration of 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. And the biggest energy level now is the second energy level, and the 2 plus the 6 gives us 8 valence electrons, which we would call a full octet. So sodium will lose an electron to obtain a full octet. And when it loses an electron to obtain a full octet, what ends up happening is it tends to form an ion um, that is negative. And when it forms an ion that is negative, hold on a second while we're loading. Because it lost one electron, it's going to become a, a, a lithium ion with a, plus, with a minus one charge. So you may recall that negatively charged atoms or ions are called cations because they're positively charged. So everything in the first column has one valence electron and it's going to lose that one valence electron and become negatively one charged. Everything in the second column has two valence electrons and it's going to lose those two electrons to become negatively charged with a minus two. And then we're going to skip over the transition metals and everything in the third column has three valence electrons and it's going to lose three electrons to become a minus three. Okay. Now, so nonmetals tend to gain electrons to obtain a full octet. So here we go. So for example, if I look at oxygen, uh, if I look at nitrogen, right? Nitrogen's electron configuration is 1s2, 2s2, 2p123. Okay, 2p3. So at this point, if we wanted to have eight valence electrons, we have to add electrons to it. So I'm going to say, I'm just going to throw some electrons at it. Plus, let's see, how many valence, well, we should start with how many valence electrons does it have right now? So we've got the biggest energy level is the second. So two plus three is five valence electrons. So we want to throw three electrons at it. So we're going to, like, so we're just going to take and add three electrons right to this guy. And when we do that, we get a new electron configuration of 1s2, 2s2, 2p, and I'm going to change it to purple now, and it's going to be 2p6. Well, now it has the 2 plus the 6, which is 8 valence electrons. Okay. And it has an electron configuration like neon, which we know to be a stable noble gas. So when atoms gain electrons... When atoms gain electrons, they end up becoming negatively charged. And when they become negatively charged, we would say, oh, I gotta skip ahead here. Oh man. Do, 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 do. Okay. When they gain electrons, they become negatively charged and they become type of ion that we call an anion. So here, like we just like I just discussed, nitrogen had uh, five valence electrons, we threw three electrons at it to get to eight, and now it's considered a stable arrangement of electrons or a full octet. Oxygen has six valence electrons, so we threw two at it, and now it has eight. Okay, so that becomes a more stable arrangement of electrons. Fluorine has seven valence electrons, so we throw one at it, and it becomes a full valence electron shell, a full octet, so that becomes a minus one charge. And then your noble gases, they're already full, so we, even if we throw electrons at them, they're not going to make a difference, so 
they, they have no charge. So again, your metals will lose electrons to become positively charged. Your nonmetals will gain electrons to become negatively charged. And each column, uh, the elements all have the same number of, of electrons lost or gained. Um, and as a result of that, it's pretty easy to identify. Um, so take a second or a few and go ahead and identify or answer these questions. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to give you a second to answer these and then we'll come back and we'll talk about the answers. Okay, so it looks like a bunch of you have worked your way through this um, or are almost done doing this, so let's talk about the answers for a second. So question number one in the practice says, name an element that is a halogen. So you're thinking to yourself, huh, I'm going to go over to the halogen column, which is column 17, and I'm going to pick any element there that would be a halogen. And in this case, it could be fluorine or chlorine or bromine or iodine or acetine or uniceptium. Okay. Question number two says, name a metalloid that is in the 14th group in the fourth period. So you're going to go over to the 14th group and then go down to the fourth period. And when you do that, you should get an element that we would refer to as germanium. Okay. Um, now, what charge will sulfur likely form? You can go to the periodic table and you can see that sulfur has six valence electrons. And if it has six valence electrons, it's going to probably gain two electrons to get to eight. So it's going to have a minus two charge. And then the next question is, what charge will calcium likely form? Well, calcium has got two valence electrons, so it's going to lose those two electrons to get to have eight valence electrons. And so it'll become calcium with a plus two charge. Now, how many valence electrons does silicon have? Well, you locate silicon. Um, and once you've located silicon, you can look at the column and say, oh, silicon happens to be in the column that has four valence electrons. And then lastly, uh, how many valence electrons does magnesium have? So magnesium is in the second column, and you'll locate that element, and you'll say, oh, it has two valence electrons, just like the rest of the elements in that column. And so that's kind of an example of your homework that you're going to be working on uh, shortly here. So the homework that you have is a worksheet that looks something like this as it comes up. And um, so it's got, I don't know, it's got like eight questions. It seems like it's not too super difficult. So what I'm going to tell you to do here is um, I'd like you to stay on the call until you've completed the worksheet. Um, and I'll know it's completed if you have submitted it because it is on Google Classroom for you to go ahead and, and work through. Uh, so what I would do if I were you is go ahead and uh, work through this worksheet and submit it. There's two options. One's a PDF, in which case you can handwrite your answers. And the other one is a uh, Google Doc, which means you can type in your answers. Both are completely and totally acceptable. And then once you've gone ahead and completed the worksheet and hit submit, uh, you can go ahead and log out for the day. So um, I'm going to stay on the call here. I'm going to uh, be here if you need me. If you have any questions, let me know I'll in the chat or unmute yourself. Um, I will be monitoring Google Classroom to see as that you're turning them in. And um, let me know if you have any questions. Yes.